I don't think I've ever gotten a, you're on, babe. <laughs> I love you, Kim. Um, good morning and welcome to Hempfield Church of the Brethren. Uh, enjoy the sunshine, even if it's blinding you over here. It's nice to see after, I don't know what God was thinking yesterday, but we're just going to pretend it was the last one. In my head, it was the last one. So enjoy it, and then it's all going to go away. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank you for coming. If you are here with us or if you are watching us, we welcome you. Um, there's a few announcements. If you are a visitor here with us today, if you go out in the back, we have a cute little gift package for you um, to thank you for joining us this morning. Um, and a couple little announcements I'm going to touch on. I know I'm not supposed to talk about them a lot because of time, but they have to do with spring. And I just really needed to point them out. So um, don't forget, number one, this has nothing to do with spring, but there is delicious soup out there. If you're interested, stop in at John Noss Hall. And then uh, egg hunt is coming up which means Easter's coming, which means it's gonna be spring and it's gonna be warm. So that's where my brain was this morning when I was looking at what the announcements were. Egg hunt is coming up. You're gonna see more information about that in uh, the bulletin, as well as out in the narthex, there's gonna be signups um, to come and help fill eggs and also participate in the egg hunt. Um, we also um, have flowers for sale out there if you're interested. Uh, they will decorate our lovely um, sanctuary for Easter and then they can go home with you and decorate your home or your yard if you plant them outside afterwards. And this was so cool. Vacation Bible School. You're going to start seeing things about sign up for Vacation Bible School, which is one of the best things in the whole year for the church. Uh, so keep an eye out for that if you're interested in helping out and participating in that, or if you have kids that would participate in that. Um, please uh, keep an eye out for more announcements about that. I have an announcement from Jen Haup. Good morning. And I am here to talk to you guys about one great hour of sharing. And before we start, there is a video that Dave can cue up there and show. These are our kids. They were actually making banks for one great hour of sharing. When I grew up, they used to give us cardboard banks. But thanks to Miss Emmy Schott, she helped me greatly to come up with a way to make a fish bank for these kids. And this is how we got them involved in the One Great Hour of Sharing. And they've been collecting the funds for about a month now. So anybody with kids has probably seen them. Just a little synopsis about One Great Hour of Sharing. It's a way that we can put money towards different things. Church of the Brethren um, would have activities that would involve farmers and helping educate them and helping them with their crops. It also, as I told the kids, helps with clean water and those things. So when I asked the kids, I said, did you brush your teeth? You turned on the faucet. Did you take a drink this morning? You turned on the faucet. Not everybody has that benefit. So this money will go towards that. Uh, it also will help with helping the pastors and the leaders in the community, helping them financially. And just in general, it's a way that we can be the hands and feet of Christ. There are envelopes out in the narthex. As soon as you come out, right above the bulletin area, there is a sign that says one great hour of sharing, and then an envelope. We will be collecting these envelopes next to, I mean, you can put, obviously put them in this week, but next week also is going to be our one great hour of sharing. So these are our banks. If anybody has them, don't forget you have them. And if you could just uh, participate by grabbing an envelope out front, it goes, it goes to Hemfield Church of the Brethren, and in the memo line, it is one great hour of sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Um, our call to worship today is Psalms 40, 1 through 10. <clears throat> this is a Psalm of David. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. 
He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of, my, of, out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None can compare with you. I will, I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. In sacrifice and offering, you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering, you have not required. Then I said, behold, I come in the scroll, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O oh Lord. I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. I'd like to invite you to stand um, and join with us in praise and worship.
I just love my church family. I'm sorry. I just was seeing here, and it's so good. It was two years ago that the world shut down, and it is so incredible to be here with you and to share space with you. Um, even if it's lousy out and some people couldn't come because of that, or the time change, which in all honesty, maybe I wouldn't be here if I wasn't the worship leader, because um, it felt really good in bed this morning. Um, but for whatever reason, I know that you're here, and that is such an amazing blessing to me. Our scripture, uh, Philippians 3, 1 to 11. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for the, those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Judah, of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of, from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Please join with me in prayer. Good morning, Lord. I thank you for today. Um, I thank you for the beautiful sunshine. I thank you for the snow that I know is helping the green underneath grow. I thank you for each person that was able to join us here today and for those who are joining us virtually or who might be watching us later on. I thank you for them. I thank you for the warmth of our sanctuary and the gift of this building. I thank you for um, all the people that came in here ahead of me this morning who had to get up and out of bed even earlier than I did to make sure that things were up and running and I thank you for them. I thank you so much for the beautiful voices uh, that raise your name in, in praise this morning for the giftedness of our musicians and um, the tech crew that's in the back that's making sure we can hear everything. I thank you for each of them. I thank you for the folks that come in in between services and make sure that this is a nice, clean, beautiful place to meet. Um, I thank you for Doug and his heart for you and for the words that you have laid on him today, Lord, I pray that we would have open ears and an open mind to hear what we're supposed to hear, not what Doug is saying, but what you're saying, Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to that. <clears throat> I thank you for the joy of upcoming spring. Um, I thank you for the joy of being able to um, maybe relax a little bit more after the um, COVID. Um, I know it's still there. I know people are still um, wary of it. I know that it is still something we need to be prepared for and aware of, Lord, but I thank you that we can have maybe a little lessening, a little breathing room, Lord. I thank you for that. I pray that right now um, you would be with Jim Musser as he is recovering from surgery. Lord, I understand that he is in pain, and I, I know that hip surgery, that's a big piece of bone, Lord, that is getting changed around. And um, I pray that you would give his body healing strength. Um, 
help him to be able to bounce back quickly and to be uh, free of pain um, very quickly and to be able to move around and enjoy the upcoming beautiful weather that we have. I pray that you would be with Roger uh, Omer right now, Lord. I pray um, that you would give him peace. You would give the doctors and those who care for him wisdom. Um, if it be your will, that his body be healed, Lord. I pray that that would happen. Um, but whatever your plan is, Lord, I know that Roger loves you very much and that he um, has you with him throughout this. I pray that Gladys would also be touched as she has to uh, go on this journey with Roger. And um, they have been together for so long. I pray that you would lift her up and the family around them. Um, I pray that you would be with those who feel alone. Uh, that's hard. And I know that you're always with me. Um, but I know that I've been in deep, dark places where I've forgotten that. And that's a scary, lonely place. And I pray that you would be with those people. Help them to feel your comfort and your warmth and your love for them. I pray that you would lift them up. Help someone to think of them. Help it to pop into their head. And they're like, hey, I need to go see or I need to reach out to. And I pray that they would do that. And they would listen to your voice. And they would be a, um, a bright spot in that person's day so they don't feel so alone. I pray that you would be with Nancy Kreider's family as she passed on Friday, Lord. I pray that you would give them strength as they navigate this. Um, I thank you that she is with you and she is feeling your peace, but I know it is hard for those that are left behind. And I pray that you would give them your comfort and your love. Um, Lord, I pray that you would be with the folks in the Ukraine. Um, I can't even imagine uh, what they're going through, and uh, but you can. You know their hearts. You know what's happening, and I pray that you would come alongside them, give them your strength. Um, I pray also that you would be with those in authority in Russia. Um, you can do anything. And you can change even the hardest of hearts. And what an amazing thing that would be if things turned around and you were seen in all of this, Lord. Um, but you have your plan, and we just have to trust in that. Um, but, you know, if you're listening, which I know you are, <laughs> I'm just putting in a word that maybe that would be really cool. Um, I thank you for um, our church leadership, and I pray that you would be with them as they uh, handle the day-to-day -day things here at church, as well as the, um, uh, the future of our church and what the plans are. Be with our kids and our youth, and help us to remember what an incredible blessing they are, and um, that we need to be there for them, and we need to invest our lives into their lives. Um, so that uh, the future has a great look to it. Um, Lord, I know that we have amazing kids and youth in our church. We have been beyond blessed in that, and help us to remember that and not to forget about them. And again, I pray, Lord, that you'll be with our church family. I pray that uh, you would be with us today as we go out into your world and we share your love. Um, help it not just to be today, but to be every day this week um, until we can meet again. I just thank you for all your blessings and all the incredible things that you have done for us. Um, help us to have your peace. Help us to not fear, but to look to you for your strength and guidance. And I pray that you would, um, yeah, just help us to look to you in everything. Now, please join me as we do the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
day keeps getting better. Um, our next scripture is Philippians 3, 12 to 21. <clears throat> Not that I have already attained, attained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, do not consider that I have made, it on, have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I'm going to read that again. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will, will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me. And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame. With minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body to make his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. I don't know if we'll need the chair here today or not. I have this tension inside of me. Part of me wants to have a discussion and part of me wants to preach. So we'll, just, we'll see which personality wins today. We are working through our series on suffering through Lent. And even in the tension of today, I just I find it so appropriate that today marks two years that everything closed down and we spring ahead. And to that end, for any pastor who finishes up his sermon on Sunday mornings, my heart goes out to him or her. Two years ago, I remember sitting in the office uh, in the afternoon and receiving a call first from uh, Josh, I believe, saying that they weren't going to have cell group on Sunday, and then speaking with Shirley and Jason and deciding to close things down. And I think we would do ourselves a disservice if we did not acknowledge what we've gone through in the last two years. So we're going to do that as we walk through Philippians 3 with Paul and acknowledge ways that may parallel our time in his. Now, Barclay acknowledges that there's kind of a break. You know, Philippians, by and large, is a joyful letter. He talks about rejoicing often. And even opening up our passage, he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. He often talks about rejoicing. This is while he's sitting in prison near the end of his death, near, near the end of his life. 
He's talking about rejoicing. And Paul was in prison. His ministry stretched over 14 to 16 years, I believe. So there were many, many letters written. The ones that have been preserved we have in our Scripture. And some believe that chapter 3, verse 2 and following may have been part of another letter that was put in, or it could have been just stream of thought. You know, in the midst of writing his letter, a messenger comes to him and tells him about what's happening. And he's like, oh, they're starting to stray from the message that had been given to them because these men have come in and started teaching them things that actually contradict the Scripture. They, they're beginning to put their faith in the flesh. Now what Paul was fighting was, was Jewish uh, believers who said, you need to follow the law first, and then you can follow Jesus. There have been many people in the last two years who have told us how to interpret this time, what is right, what is wrong, and they've spoken with much confidence and have caused much dissension and much division. The way that we have approached this time has been a struggle. Now, for Paul, he begins to break down the confidence that he could have. He says, circumcised on the eighth day, which means he was born Jewish. He was born into it. He wasn't uh, a convert. Of the nation of Israel, God's chosen race. Of 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 the tribe of Benjamin, Benjamin was the only son of Jacob born in the promised land. The best of the best. A Hebrew of Hebrews. In Jerusalem, the Jewish, speak, the, the Jewish people spoke Hebrew. By that point, it had been primarily a dead language. Many of the Jews in the diaspora, many of the Jews who were outside of Jerusalem, spoke Greek or Latin, you know, the, the tongue of the people. And he is saying, if anyone has confidence in the flesh... I was born into it. And then he goes into his accolades, his accomplishments. As to the law of Pharisee, Pharisee means the set apart ones. There were about 6,000. And they were, in society's eyes, above everyone else. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness, which is in the law found blameless. He followed the law to a T. Not only was he born into it, but when it came to following through in his life, he was the man with the plan. He was the elite. In the American society, he probably would have had book deals and multi-campus churches and be an international speaker. People would strive after what he had to say. And yet he says, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all those things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. Rubbish, garbage, dung, you'll see it translated in different ways. Now, imagine Paul writing this. He's gone from a Pharisee, someone that everyone looks up to. He was on all the TV shows. He was on all the talk shows. The morning news, the evening news. He was fervent in his faith. 
and spoke down to the people who didn't walk his way. And people applauded him. And now he's sitting in prison. He's lost everything for the sake of Christ. How would we view such a person? Imagine one of our local or national leaders who call the crowds of many to them so that they can hear what they have to say. Laying it all down for Christ. Giving it all the way. Giving it all up. Saying, there is a better way. How would such a person be viewed today? You see, he's holding this tension of what people put their faith in. What people put their confidence in. What do we put our confidence in? Our strength, our righteousness, our laws, no drinking, no smoking, no, uh, no being out after dark, no cards, no speeding. If you vote this way, how can you be a follower of Christ? If you vote that way, how can you be a follower of Christ? Do we put confidence in our family line, our church tradition, our church structures, the way we do things? Do we put confidence in our work and our abilities? How many people's confidence have been shaken in the last two years? How many things that we have put our faith and trust in have been shaken and stirred in the last two years? Tension in families, as we understand this virus, this vaccine, the protocols, the politics. Tension at work. And this is the interesting thing in our society. For some, work has gone on just as it's gone on for the last 40 years. For others, they've created home offices. How many, how many, uh, how many uh, short video clips do you see with someone on a business call? They're in a shirt and tie or a nice dress, and their kids come running in, and they're like, ha ha! Because they had to work from home. They didn't have a home office before. It's even more fun when those people get up and you realize they're wearing gym shorts. They got a shirt and tie and, and gym shorts on. They're in their pajamas yet. You know why? Because they can be. And we would work that way if we were allowed. Zoom. Facebook Live. A number of churches went on a crash course of technology. And by crash, I do mean it was awkward and ugly at times. Visitation, social distancing, masks, worshiping at home, being at home. That, that, you know, Karen named that this morning, the isolation that many of us felt. We put confidence in our flesh. As a minister, it has been painful to watch believers attacking one another over politics in the church. And there has been a sense of confusion, abandonment, and disorientation that I have not experienced since I was a child. I forgot it was there. You know, and I, I, was, I was talking with someone earlier this week, and, and they named this, and I just want to name it also. There's been a heaviness as we've come together. 
But I don't think it's just here. Anyone else feel burdened in this time? Loss of relationships, sense of identity, whether individual or corporate. I mean, things have changed. Good, bad, or indifferent. Can we acknowledge these feelings? And yet Paul says, Whatever things were gained to me, those things I counted loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And I count them but rub- rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. When Paul writes no, it's not knowledge. It's not just knowledge. It's an intimate knowing. It's a knowing in living it out. It goes beyond what we can know about Christ to knowing what he actually experienced. The one commentator compared it to the, the, uh, the, you know, the King James Version. It talks about how Adam knew his wife. There is no more intimate knowledge than knowing your wife that way. It's this deep intimacy with Jesus to know what he actually experienced. You see, we have been called to this time, people, and purpose to testify of the good things God is doing, to call others to the way of Jesus Christ our Lord, and to build bridges into our community. We can live in the past or we can strive forward to what God is calling us to. And we need to be honest, we are a smaller body. We are not a larger church. Which means all hands will be needed. Every single person will be needed. To pray, to serve, to strengthen, to equip. You see, we have teams here. We have the outreach team, the fellowship and hospitality team, the education team. We have all these teams here. But the teams are not here to do the work. The teams are here to call and equip you to do the work of God in here and in our community. You see, the church is one of, if not the last, multi-generational entity, and we all need one another. The older need the younger. The energy, the creativity, the questions. When I when I was with the Almers uh, Friday, their family was over, and uh, the great grandchildren, two and four years old. (laughs) You know, people always apologize when there's kids running around the house, and they're like, "Sorry, we couldn't have more of a conversation." You don't be sorry. I have kids, they want to race cars across the floor, great. I used to do that at 6 o'clock on a, on a Saturday morning and wake my parents up because it had to crash into the door. <laughs> God, God has a sense of humor because I now have a son. Um, the older need the younger. The younger need the older. If you're younger and you have questions, go to those around you. As I look around, I promise every single person here you could sit down and have a conversation with and say, hey, I'm really struggling with something right now. Or, hey, I have a question about God. Can you help me uh, with this? Can you help me make sense of this? And they'll sit down and they'll listen and they'll, you can walk through Scripture together. You need their wisdom You need their knowledge. You see, in relationships have to go beyond the two hours on a Sunday morning 
They need to go to meals and games and outings and service projects. You see, it's the life we have together in Christ. We are sealed in the same Spirit so that when we speak to one another, we can hear the voice of Jesus. When we sit with one another, it's as though His presence is with us. I spoke at Lampeter uh, last week, and Matt Cooper was there. Matt was the fellow who would go and visit with my uncle when he was dying of cancer. And sometimes they wouldn't say anything. Sometimes they would actually take a nap because Rick, that's all Rick could do. And Matt would get home and his wife would ask him, did you have a good nap today? Because there's something that presence cannot be substituted for anything else. You see, we dig into Scripture to hear the voice of the Good Shepherd and weigh what we hear and what we see and what we do. And I want us to say something together. The forms may change. Say it with me. The form may change. The function remains the same. You see, as mouthpieces of Christ, we beg others be reconciled to God through Jesus. And the form of what that church may look like may be different. How we educate, how we equip, how we serve. But the function remains the same. And as I was wrestling with this passage this week, as I was wrestling with knowing what Paul says, he says, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I think that's where the American church stops. Bam! We want to know the power. We want to know the victory. When I grew up, we wanted to follow the victorious Jesus, the white stallion Jesus, the overcoming Jesus. But what else does Paul say? And the fellowship of his sufferings. We didn't want to follow the suffering Jesus, not the humiliated Jesus, not the one who had to die on the cross, be betrayed by his closest friends, have thousands sit down to be fed by him, and the next day walk away when the teaching got too hard. So many people abandoned him that he even asked the twelve, will you leave me also? Imagine a speaker today having thousands of people swarm to hear him speak. And the next day, seeing that crowd walk away. In America, he would be a failure. We don't want to follow the Jesus whose friends could not stay awake in the garden when he asked them to pray. Or the Jesus who healed ten lepers and only one returned to give thanks. We don't want to follow the Jesus who was wrongfully arrested, beaten, whipped, and falsely accused under a stacked trial. We don't want to follow a Jesus whose closest followers denied him, questioned his teachings, and yet Jesus continued to love them, even washing their feet including the one who would betray him. Following that kind of Jesus, the one who suffers betrayal and abandonment, being falsely accused and lied about by religious leaders and those in power, the one that individuals questioned and thousands walked away from, that kind of Jesus would be a failure today. And yet Isaiah says he was despised and rejected, not attractive by any measure. As far as people were concerned, he was cursed by God. But, what if in knowing that kind of Jesus, and I mean truly knowing, experiencing, feeling, mentally processing, grieving, all those things that he experienced in our own walk, 
What if walking his very path and saying his words, not my will, but yours be done? What if in our suffering and dying, we can truly begin to understand the power of the resurrection? The power of the Holy Spirit. The power that not even death can overcome. What if that power that sets a person free from their drug and alcohol addiction, the power that heals a man or a woman who's been carrying an open wound from the past, whether it came from a personal trial or or affliction. What if we lived in that resurrection power that allows us to truly love our enemy so much that we would want to invite them and bless them with a meal. Have you seen news clips like that? Ukrainians feeding Russian soldiers. Remember, Paul was a persecutor of the church. He even names it here. And when God showed up to Silas, he says, hey, Saul's got to come to your house and you need to pray for him. So I was like, nope. I know who that guy is. Why do you want me to die? And it's revealed to him that Christ had encountered Saul along the path and he revealed to, to him how much he would need to suffer so that when Saul shows up at Silas's house, he says, brother, the very first words out of his mouth, to his enemy, to the man who was putting people down for walking the way of Jesus, was, brother. What if in our suffering we realize that nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord, and that whether we live or die, we walk in Christ. What if suffering is not the end, but a means of redemption? A means of resolve to stand and face the enemy and say, even now, there's nothing that you can take away from me that I don't already have in Jesus. You see, even after two years of whatever this is, we are still here. And God is still moving. And God is still working through each and every person gathered. Scripture says, though the righteous may stumble, they will not fall, for the hand of God upholds them. We are still here and we have work to do. We have work today. You see, the form may change. We may need to educate our little ones differently. We may gather around Scripture differently. But the function remains the same. You see, when we disciple across generations, our network strengthens because it's not something typically found in society. And if you don't believe me, we can drive... I mean, will we need to go five miles to hit different communities? 55 and plus communities. Uh, Retirement communities. Imagine having a community for like 20-somethings. I'm sorry, this is only for 20 to 34-year-olds. The rest of you are not allowed in. I mean, if we're honest, some of us would be celebrating. Ha <laughs> ha, no kids run through my yard. Most of my neighbors growing up probably would have appreciated that. <laughs> I, see your, I see your yard's a shortcut. Let's ride my bike through there. Um, you see, when we disciple across generations, something that we don't typically see in the world, our faith is strengthened because we have wisdom, energy, knowledge, faith, joy, love, peace. We're all given different gifts and different abilities to strengthen one another, to build one another up. And as long as you have breath in your body, you can glorify Christ Jesus, our Lord. You 
see, we need to commit to one another and acknowledge that I'm not leaving you and I will walk with you through thick and thin, whether it's to the pearly gates at your death or the gates of hell in your trial. I am not leaving. I am not letting go. Christ is doing something right now. And we'll go through it together. And in those trials, may we echo Christ's words to Peter. Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. I am praying for you. And when you return, testify to what God has done and strengthen the body. Whew. You see, we live in this tension. We miss people who are no longer here. And we celebrate the people that God is bringing. Because without this time, we may not have known you. God is leading in this time. Will we follow? Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in God, of God in Christ Jesus. Let us press on toward that upward goal together. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn.
we sing that without the organ? Can you give us a starting note? Somewhere? Uh, uh, at the refrain. This is my story. Sounds so good. Rejoice. Form may change, but function remains the same. What we do, we do together. In the gift of suffering and in the power of the resurrection of Christ, we can forget what lies behind and strive forward to what lies ahead. Go in peace. On behalf of Hempfield Church of the Brethren, we thank you for joining us for today's service. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.